everybody, and welcome to another episode of Cartoon Commentary. Today we're going to be taking a look at the very first episode ever of Transformers, G1 variety that is. It's More Than Meets the Eye Part 1, and joining me is one of uh, the Patreon subscribers, the Patreon supporters of my YouTube channel, Adam Burkett. Adam, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful, thank you very much. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining me on this cartoon commentary. These are always really cool to load up and just hang out and chat uh, along with. Before we get to that though, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What part of the world are you from? Uh, right now I'm in South Carolina of the USA. South Kakalaki. You got any snow, <laughs> any snow there? That's right. We just had a, a hundred year event here uh, the first week of January and it was crazy. Beautiful. So you can take the old snow cat out. Exactly. It's nothing like Canada, but, you know, when they get a little bit here, it's serious. Awesome. And uh, you're a Transformers fan as well? Oh, yeah. Huge Transformers fan, Ninja Turtles, uh, and then, of course, you know, G.I. Joe, Thundercats, He-Man, all that stuff. All the 80s stuff, the uh, Age of Heroes. Um, do you watch a lot of uh, vintage cartoons? Yeah, I have most of them on DVD and... Uh, I mean, you know, they just get you through anything. You turn those on and you can just watch them forever. Absolutely. You can't you can't see me. We don't have video enabled here, but uh, I got a big smile on my face because I just imagine He-Man. Um, you know, I'll go into my home gym and uh, some days are a lot more difficult than others. Uh, and uh, an episode of He-Man, when he holds his magical sword aloft and says, I have the power, then uh, it might sound pretty cheese to a lot of people but uh when he has the power he reminds me that i do too and uh you know he's helped me and a lot of the other 80s heroes have helped me get through a lot of uh difficult workouts and uh and you know i just need to watch these old 80s shows i didn't realize it for quite some time but um started to notice the uh <clears throat> the really negative and and cynical sarcastic tone that was starting to seep into everything in uh, movies and TV and even comic books. And uh, I think it was Stranger Things that really woke me up and made me realize, hey, this seems so different than everything else coming out today. Why is that? And uh, when I started to look at all that old stuff again from the 80s, that's when I realized, wow, have times changed. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, I need to go back and watch these old cartoons because I find them so uh, inspiring. It reminds me of that uh, episode of Seinfeld where Jerry's talking to, I think, his mom, and she asks, well, "What are you watching?" Oh, I'm watching an episode of Tiny Toons. You know, it's 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 a whole. There's a wholesome quality to it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, folks. So everyone listening along on YouTube, you can follow along with us if you queue up your Transformers episode one, more than meets the eye, part one and uh, queue it up on either your DVDs or I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but uh, there's ways to watch it. It's popular enough that it's around if you get my uh, drift. So uh, right now we're, Adam and I are both paused in the black. That's like a moment before the episode starts, the intro starts and the Autobot and Decepticon symbols swoop in. So, as customary on these commentaries, I'm going to give you a countdown. Three, two, one, play. And you're going to press play when I say play. Everybody ready? Ready. And here we go. Three, two, one, play. And does this take me back? I remember watching Transformers on Sunday morning, boys and girls. This is... Before it was a worldwide phenomenon, um, it was just this odd curiosity, like, what is this, transforming robots? And I had had a little bit of exposure to giant robots with the Force 5 uh, cartoon they used to play here in North America. It was an adaption of uh, some Japanese anime, uh, Voltron, the non-lion version, as well as... Uh, grandizer so uh, that had gotten me interested in giant robots but transformers was just something completely different even this we take a look at this opening shot of cybertron it's so beautiful and artistic 
It is a beautiful drawing. And it's, uh, it really uh, does feel more like an anime than a, a lot of these old 80s cartoons. They get accused of being toy commercials. And yes, that was one of the purposes of them. But it feels to me like so much more effort is put into this than was necessary. Uh, it just seems like you got a lot of creative people working on this. And instead of doing the bare minimum, like on some cartoons, I get the feeling maybe Mask is one of those where maybe the bare minimum was done. Um, in order to just sell the product. This to me feels like very creative people who said, let's run with this. Let's create a legend instead of just, uh, let's get, th you know, let's get this over with. Yeah, I definitely get the anime feel. Uh, I'm not sure. I remember Hasbro, you know, they worked with Takara in the beginning to get the Transformers going. I think they might have done it in Japan. Mm -hmm. Takara, yeah, they started it. Um and I, I like the, it's a small attention to detail, and sometimes they didn't have the luxury of, of going all out with some of these details just because of budget and time and resources. But I do love the fact that Wheeljack and Bumblebee here don't have their Earth forms. Uh, it's a little cheesy that they have their Earth robotic forms, like Bumblebee has Volkswagen feet here. <laughs> they tr they tried, you know, they tried. So I understand them saying, maybe someone saying to the artists, no, don't change the way the robots look. Uh, you, you can, you know, we'll let you change the vehicles, okay? They can look like space vehicles. And there's Bumblebee transforming into a space vehicle. But uh, I, I appreciate the fact that the... Uh, Autobots here and the Decepticons, the Seekers now, they transform into these pyramid-looking things. little detail, uh, but I like it. What I don't like is later on in the show, when they go back to Cybertron, and there's Seekers who have never been to Earth, I presume, and they transform into Earth Jets. That's one of those little uh, we-don't-care shortcuts. Yeah, but I just imagine myself as a kid, and I would I want Starscream to look like that. Yeah. And now, finally, here we are 30 years later. Now, we finally have companies making the toys to look like the cartoons. Yeah. Yeah, those masterpiece uh, Transformers are amazing. And we're just a few minutes into the episode here, but already the more adult tone of this is coming through. Um, rarely did anyone get really hurt bad in He-Man that I can remember. Uh, even G.I. Joe, a lot of guys were unscathed despite you know the turmoil that they would go through bumblebee gets blasted here and he's in really bad shape within minutes of this episode starting and he's the smallest cutest of the autobots so if he can almost get slagged it establishes higher stakes than most 80s cartoons um we're doing in this day and age i like the introduction of the uh mass uh effect or how mass you call shifting. it so mass shifting so yeah. you can see that they change size not just so they so they get around the toys you know yeah a cassette tape is as big as a truck you know it works yeah i'm glad you bring that up for people who uh you know we're both very uh well versed in the transformers lore but for people who didn't follow transformers as much there's some ridiculousness that goes on that they just didn't have time to deal with um and it's called mass shifting, where you'll see it later on when they become Earth um, vehicles and objects. But Soundwave is one of the biggest culprits. Megatron here is another one, changing from a giant robot to something that's teeny tiny. And it's called mass shifting, being able to actually shrink. And then another little trick that they can do to explain away uh, animation errors or animation oddities like optimus prime when he transforms his trailer disappears it just scoots off the screen and that's called subspace uh, the concept is that he's able to store uh, the trailer or other autobots can store things like weapons or other pieces in i guess another dimension called subspace ah uh, yes that's right so just go with it. Just enjoy it. <laughs> I just recently did a, a review on Tron and I'm reminded of uh, Tron Legacy and I'm reminded of how many people nitpick that movie. And I read a great review on that movie that said it's a ridiculous world. They're walking around computer programs wearing pants and drinking. So why are you nitpicking? 
the little details, just go with it. So exactly. I think it's important for, you know, especially for transformers, just go with it. You know, if you, if you go with it, then you'll really enjoy it. But if you're a nitpicker, well, not only will you not enjoy this, you won't enjoy anything. Yeah. You mentioned the, uh, animation errors. Oh my gosh. There, if you go on TF Wiki, I mean, you will see a huge list where everybody's compiled just every little thing, and there's dozens and dozens of errors. Yeah, turn it into a drinking game, or if you're straight edge <laughs> like me, uh, bite the donut game. You definitely don't want to eat a donut every time there's an animation error because you're going to put away a lot of donuts. Um, but here's the Autobot shuttle getting uh, attacked by the Decepticons. Again, this is all raising stakes. Uh, Transformers G1 is as cool as it turned out to be. I think because of these first couple minutes, you, you don't need a while to get into it. They're right off to the races, so to speak, uh, right off the bat. Yeah, you have that epic war feel right from the beginning. You know what's going on with the Decepticons and the Autobots. And I also like how they <clears throat> establish the Autobots as, um, you know, they're, they're not your typical heroes who smash the villains who thump them like He-Man would often do. Uh, you know, not to rag on He-Man. I loved He-Man. But uh, He-Man would thump uh, the evil forces of Skeletor repeatedly, and G.I. Joe would thump Cobra. In this, you got the Autobots running away from Cybertron because they've basically lost the war. So, mm -hmm. uh, or, or stalemate. Um, so I like the fact that the Autobots weren't the clear superior uh, side in this war later on in this uh, three-parter we'll see Optimus and Megatron fight and Megatron beats Optimus on on the bridge yeah, there's maybe a little bit of chicanery there but you know it wouldn't be the first time that Megatron just plain overpowered Optimus that was one of the best errors there Optimus yells attack in Megatron's voice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's when you look back at it it's really impressive that they got as much right as they did because even though for a lot of people these are all household names at the time i could literally see the voice actors say or even the animators or the sound editors going which one is this oh that one's uh optimus optimus yeah, that's his name like this was all new to everybody and it could be quite overwhelming when you think about it there's what like 18 autobots just in the the original uh, the original uh, expedition party to Earth. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I couldn't imagine keeping track of all these characters. It's a lot of names and a lot of uh, characters and attitudes to keep track of. Another thing I loved about Transformers was how unique every character was. Uh, Gears, the Grump, Hound, the. Uh, uh, the Nature Lover, Ironhide, the tough old John Wayne style of Transformer. I just love that they, that was my problem with GoBots. Everyone just seems so similar in that. Whereas in Transformers, um, the Autobots at least had uh, unique personalities. What do you think about the, uh, the three-part beginning? I remember Ninja Turtles had a five-part and so did G.I. Joe. Yeah. But Transformers is a, is a three-part beginning, so I wonder when did it all start? Um, I like it. I, I like that it got to the point quicker. Um, you, I guess you could just tack on the next two episodes and say that's part of the, the opening, you know, make the three-parter or five-parter. I, I personally liked it uh, because even though I like the G.I. Joe five-parter, and they would do that a lot, like when G.I. Yeah. Joe... Uh, or Transformers after the movie, they did a five-parter. Um, yeah. Five, five Faces of Darkness, and G.I. Joe would have their Arise, Serpenter Arise. Those are great, but they, they sometimes feel like they're dragging. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it works to for the most part because there are so many characters that you can keep cutting to, and it's not the same characters. But just uh, to compare a five-parter to a three-parter, I like how concise the Transformers three-parter feels. I I love the intro, either a five-parter or in this case a three-parter. I I think the way they set it up, they just it's the best part of the whole series. Just the first few episodes. 
Yeah. It really makes the Decepticons seem like um, parasites. They've sucked Cybertron dry. They're on a new planet, and they haven't missed a step, even though they've been on ice in stasis for... I, I can never remember how many millions of years. Um, but that was another cool aspect of it, the fact that they've been here all along. Um, even though they seem like they're futuristic, they're actually ancient. It's kind of like Star Wars, right? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Exactly. And then you have Beast Wars too, which is part of the G1 canon. Yeah, that, that was mind-blowing when... Uh, it didn't seem like it at first, but when they tie in to, I don't know if we should spoil it. I, maybe it's been long enough, but uh, my mind was blown when they reveal the uh, tie in to G1. I, I just did the uh, Orson Welles clap because it was so well done. <laughs> yeah, Transformers and Earth, they go way back and just, they kind of they kind of try to display that in the movies, too. Yeah. There's a good old Casey Kasem as uh, Cliff Jumper. I just love that uh, the radio guy Casey Kasem is the uh, the big, well, the little rambunctious Cliff Jumper, one of the most uh, not bloodthirsty but uh, war thirsty Autobots on the team. And that's one thing I really liked about this original lineup. They always have a special place for me, the original 18 Autobots, because they they didn't do the typical characterization. You had Cliff Jumper who wanted to fight, and uh, you know you might have a, a larger character who you would think is, uh, you know, would be more of a warrior. But uh, you've got, you know, a pacifist like, uh, let's say, Mirage wants to go home more than he wants to fight. He's just there because he's, I don't know, got enlisted or um, drafted or something. Yeah, that's another great thing about having so many cars is there's so many personalities they could fit those in. Mm -hmm. This is a great scene right here. Hound just wants to do his job. He's surveillance. He's a spy. And uh, Cliff Jumper just bollockses this all up because he just <laughs> he wants to take a pot shot at Megatron. I think that's the scene right here. All these great little hidden things that they couldn't work into the original toys, but you better believe the new, especially the third-party Masterpiece toys, they love to include things like the little wrist satellites and all the little extra gadgets. And and like that jet display right there on Soundwave. Yeah, I really like those little touches. It, it adds um, variety uh, to, the, to the toys because, oh, there's Cliff Jumper's big cannon. And the great thing about this is Hound doesn't really try to stop them. <laughs> yeah, he lets him go with it. Hound could very easily pull the cannon up, the classic, what are you doing? But he's like, eh, take the shot if you got it. And uh, again, I, I like the writing here. Cliff Jumper took the shot, but it's Hound who has to pay for it. So there were always, always these little lessons in here, accountability lessons. And it's an important lesson, I thought, for kids and even adults that, uh, you know, Cliff Jumper did something here. He had uh, he had uh, an itch to scratch, and you know he wasn't the one who had to pay for it. It was actually Hound that ended up getting blasted. And here we have a drone before drones were even thought of. Mm -hmm. And I, that's the one of the things that's kind of cheesy. He just sends his laser into the air. It's like that's awfully handy. And Cliff Jumper takes care of it easily because he's a warrior. I think that's actually his, uh, and there goes Hound, man, he really wiped out. Um, the Autobots and Decepticons, they all had functions on their boxes and their cards, and I believe uh, Cliff Jumper is listed as a warrior, which is kind of funny because he's, again, one of the smallest. I love the commercial bumpers, too. Oh, fantastic. Miss those, too. Same with um, G.I. Joe, and also the when they're cutting from one scene to another where they would have the da 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 da, da. Mm -hmm. You could just imagine the serial commercials and the toy commercials that are going to come on after that. Yeah, it's something I really miss. And I didn't grow up on those original old serials that George Lucas grew up on and influenced his Star Wars in the 80s. Um, but uh, I, I do miss the influence of those serials. I think we've gotten really far away from 
those uh, just fun hearted. And now there's a tow truck there. Is that grapple? Uh, oh, holler. Grapple hook hoist. Uh, that's hard. Yeah, that's that's one of those. Grapple wasn't part of the original lineup, and what's he doing there? I don't know. Cliff Jumper calls him Holler, but that's just one of those things where they didn't know what the thing was going to be called until, you know, maybe sometimes weeks before the box art went into production. Reflector is an awesome character. Yeah. And an awesome toy. Yep. So there's some great third party offerings of Reflector now. I've never heard you uh, specifically say which is your favorite G1 Transformer or slash toy. Um, man, so many to pick from, uh, but Optimus and Ironhide always, always come to mind. Just always like those two Optimus for just being the virtuous hero that he always was the peaceful warrior. If you've ever heard that term, I think in terms of pop culture, Optimus, uh, he fits that term to a T, uh, doesn't want to fight, but has to, uh, and then Ironhide just cause you know, he's the John Wayne of Transformers. And interestingly enough, voiced by the same guy. Oh, wow. Yeah, Peter Cullen voiced both of them. I'm more of a Decepticon lover myself. I love Frank Welker, and I love Soundwave also. Yeah, and it, yeah, absolutely. Frank Welker's absolute legend. He, If you look at his IMDb, you'll be shocked at just how many iconic characters he did. He did Slimer as well, and... Lots of Transformers. Lots of range there. He was on Scooby-Doo. He was uh, oh, the blonde-haired guy on Scooby-Doo. What was his name again? Yeah, I forget. <laughs> and Scatman Crothers is Jazz. Another one of my favorites. So cool. Hey, baby. Jazz and Blaster just go hand in hand. They really embrace the Earth culture. I feel like if there were were flat actors i mean this the show would have just died yeah i agree um uh mask i like the mask toys i've you know i try to watch the cartoon every once in a while but uh that's a perfect one to contrast with transformers the voice acting is just not there on mask uh, they don't even sound like actors to me they their readings are so dry and lifeless uh it just really sounds like people they grab from the hallway like, uh, hey, do you, uh, hey, Jim, in accounting, do you, do you want to read a line here? Do you want to be uh, Hondo McLean or, you know, whoever, Buddy Hawks? Uh, even Matt Tracker, the, the main character on Mask, is so uh, dry, almost monotone. Um, I think if they had invested in, in better voice actors like on Transformers, if they had hired the Sunbow crew, it would have been a much different. Uh, story for mask there's spike showing just how brave he is superhuman spike <laughs> punching a transformer i like that they don't go overboard with the humans here like spike tries to hit him and does nothing and then spark plug is able to push rumble away but you know he's not giving him a hip toss or <laughs> putting mma moves or anything on him they they firmly establish here that the Decepticons are the uh, dominant force here, and the humans are the damsel in distress. It's really Optimus's only Achilles heel. Um, there's there's quite a few times where he's going toe to toe with Megatron, and it's because he turns his attention to the humans that he loses the fight, which you know I think makes him the hero that he is. Definitely the sacrificial, honorable hero. You got Grimlock, who just as soon step on the humans just to get him out of the way, you know. And Grimlock is cool, but Grimlock is not someone, you know, I think kids should be really looking up to. Maybe as you get older, you can appreciate how cool Grimlock is. But I don't think having an attitude like Grimlock is going to get you through a real life. Well, they show that he was built with a small brain on purpose, so yeah. that's okay. Now we've got a little uh, montage here of everyone pairing up and fighting. <laughs> Some of these uh, long shots are funny. It just looks more like they're dancing than fighting. <laughs> and the Energon is going up. Beautiful effect on the Energon cubes. 
that takes a lot of time uh, and uh, light passes because this is all old school hand painted animation cells and whenever you see something light up like that uh, it takes a lot of passes in order to get it to look lit up like that and they do actually shoot each other unlike G.I. Joe yeah, that was one of the advantages of having the characters be robots. You can take a shot in the shoulder or the abdomen or the back. Uh, whereas on G.I. Joe, there's just a lot of dodging or uh, collateral. You know, something would blow up behind and cause someone to roll. And here, Optimus Prime, again, they're not, uh, you know, the current term is the Gary Stew or the Mary Sue. They're not making Optimus Prime like Superman um, he can't lift the thing and you know you would think he'd be able to pick it up over his head and and say uh, okay there you go but uh, yeah they they give him limits which again is important for a good character plus he is floating in the water and it would be pretty hard to lift a giant yep. grid <laughs> yep and so we saw a little uh, preview of what's to come and that's another nice thing about these classic cartoons. About 22 minutes and you're done. And we Exciting get... episode. Can't wait for the next one. Yeah, great, great intro. Just uh, scratching the surface here. And I can see why this took off because, yeah, it just feels like, wow, we didn't see anything here. But we saw, you know, so much great action, great character development. Uh, this is how you launch a property. And they didn't, even though a lot of stuff happens here, it doesn't feel like they overdid it. Like, um, I think the important thing for this episode is that the Autobots didn't win. The good guys didn't finish the episode by thumping the bad guys. It actually looks like the bad guys may, may win the day. And that's something that you use to hook people. Like, uh-oh, I gotta tune in. Uh, back in the day, you had to wait a week uh, to see the next installment of this. And... Uh, I don't believe the Autobots do much better next time out either. You have to tune in next week, kids, and you have to fall in love with these characters. And by the way, they're at Toys R Us. <laughs> if you can find them. I remember uh, looking for Optimus Prime for quite some time. He was one of the uh, one of the real uh, big sellers at the time. So, But uh, yeah, fantastic show. Love the transforming gimmick. I've seen this episode many times and... Uh, you know, I still appreciate it to this day. What was your uh, favorite part about this episode? Uh, you know, I love Soundwave. I love the way he transformed in that light pole. And just that whole Cybertron part. Cybertron's just beautiful. And it's just you, you can't wait to go back there when you see it in the beginning. Yeah, I like his Cybertronian alt mode because it's so subtle. It just basically looks like he stuck his, his uh, arms out. He tucked his head in and he leans over and that's his disguise and uh it's like wow you know that that really uh the whole thing is supposed to be robots in disguise that's the gimmick right they're supposed to blend in espionage and he's one of the best at that both with his cybertronian mode as well as his uh cassette mode you just you get it and you buy it right from the beginning absolutely well that's transformers episode one and uh, we'll be back shortly with episode two. So, uh, Adam, I want to thank you for joining me tonight on the commentary, as well as supporting the channel with the uh, with Patreon. Very happy to do it, Mr. Mercy, and namaste. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you're interested in supporting the channel as well, head over to my Patreon page in the show notes. If you have a comment about the first episode of Transformers, or any other one for that matter, scroll down and go to town, and to join the tribe, hit subscribe. Nerd mistake.